Catherine Frances Erickson was born on April 22nd, 1940 in California. She entered kindergarten there and at the age of five took dancing and piano lessons for eight or nine months. The family moved to Long Beach in July 1947 where the girl resumed dancing lessons. Now on June the 28th, 1948, Beatrice Erickson, who was the mother of Catherine Francis, was referred to Violet Burling, a teacher of beginning students, with whom the mother arranged weekly lessons for her daughter Catherine K. Francis. These lessons were at Violet Burling's studio in Long Beach. Much of the time, Harry Erickson, the father of Kay, was unemployed and Mrs. Erickson worked to support the family. After March 1948, the girl continued the accordion lessons without payment because of the parents' inability to pay. Mrs. Erickson had expressed dissatisfaction with Mr. Erickson, stating that a separation was imminent and had asked Violet Burling to take care of Kay for a period of time. On July 17, 1950, Violet Burling found that the girl had been left at the studio and Kay lived with Violet at the studio until her death on October 12, 1950. Yes, the mother dropped her daughter off at the studio and just left. Violet had an apartment on 32 Orange Street in Long Beach but preferred living at the studio because of the inconvenience of transportation and the existence of a telephone at the studio. She stated that the mother only visited the daughter once and that there was no indication of affection between the two. Now on the morning of October the 12th, 1950, in answer to a telephone call, the fire department went to Violet's studio at 6 a.m. The ambulance attendant found the body of Kay Erickson lying on a studio couch. Although apparently dead, the body was removed to the ambulance and a resuscitator applied with negative results. Upon arrival at the seaside hospital, the girl was pronounced dead. Later that morning, the body was taken to the LA County morgue where an autopsy was performed by Dr. Victor Cephalou. The body was covered with multiple cuts, burns, abrasions and contusions. The cause of death was given as aspiration of food defined by Dr. Cephalou to mean the drawing down of food into the air passages due to multiple injuries. In other words, some obstruction to normal ejaculation or vomit, such as a gag tied around the mouth. In the opinion of the examiner, none of the wounds were self-inflicted. Some of the wounds were apparently of recent origin. Others were superimposed upon older wounds. There were numerous slicing wounds, from some sharp instrument such as a razor blade, some apparently inflicted only a short time prior to the girl's death. Certain burning wounds had been produced only a few minutes or a few hours before death. A triangular area of abrasion appeared in the pubic region. There was a tear in her private area and both this area were found to be dilated and open. It was the examiner's opinion that these conditions indicated a frequent stretching of the parts over some period of time and the introduction of some object of considerable resistance. The girl's head had been subjected to a series of injuries. Some of such injuries were of recent origin, while others may have been there a few weeks before death. Marks and indentations upon wrists and ankles were compatible with the condition caused by tying straps tightly around those areas. Likewise, a state of lividity found in feet and legs was consistent with the theory that the child died while strapped in a chair. The body appeared somewhat emaciated, which condition could have been the result of a continued or intermittent series of torturing injuries and of insufficient feeding. This is sickening. Are you sick yet? Although it was not possible to fix the exact hour Kay's death was estimated to have occurred, but the guess was it was around 1 a.m. on October 12, 1950. Now Violet contended that the injuries must have been self-inflicted and that Kay had a habit of inflicting similar injuries. That Violet had never laid a hand on the child in any way and had not fastened the girl to a chair. Violet Burling stated that Kay Francis appeared to be alright at the time before she died and at the time was not strapped in a chair. Violet herself claimed she had fallen asleep in a chair after writing some music and that around 6am a noise from the room came. 
This woke her up, where the little girl was discovered strapped to a chair, but conscious and able to speak. There was a white shirt wrapped around the girl's head in bandana fashion, with the arms of the shirt tied about the neck. Another shirt was on backward, with a couple of buttons fastened in the back. When found by Violet, Kay's head was hanging down as though asleep, and her eyes appeared as though she were in a trance. After removing the straps, she claims to have placed the girl on the couch and telephoned her boss that Kay was either in a trance or dying. Her boss, Mr. Verdugo, arrived shortly thereafter. There were no eyewitnesses to the crime and no direct evidence of her guilt. However, the record discloses various circumstances leading to a legitimate inference of guilt. Violet was alone with Kay Francis in the lock studio all of the night preceding the girl's death. It was her contention that the wounds were self-inflicted, but this was refuted by medical testimony. It is improbable that the victim could have strapped herself in the chair. After all, Kay was only 10 years old. Certain witnesses testified to having previously seen Violet strap the girl to chairs and a filing cabinet and commit other acts towards the child, such circumstances leading to an inference of guilt rather than innocence. Contradicting Violet's protestations of affection for Kay and denials of the use of force of violence in the testimony of Laura Carpenter. She was nine years old and she had taken accordion lessons from Violet for two years. The witness testified that two or three days before the death, Violet had tied Kay Francis in a standing position to a filing cabinet, the girl being left tied while Mr. Verdugo took Lord and Violet out to dinner. They were gone for an hour and a half. Kay had been tied to the filing cabinet at least two or three times. The witness had also seen Violet strap Kay in a chair several times. And on one occasion, Violet had left Kay on the floor for several hours with her hands tied. Laura had seen a bandage tied all over Kay's face, except the eyes and nose, at least three or four times. On one occasion, when the children had been taken to a movie, Kay Francis's eyes were covered with several scarves which were left on during the entire picture. On other occasions, Violet had Kay for not getting the accordion right and had told the other children to kick her too. Violet had also been seen to strike Kay's hands with a ruler many times and to slap Kay quite hard across the face. On one occasion, when Laura, Jimmy and Joanne, all accordion pupils, were at the studio, Violet directed Kay to pull her pants down, stand about two feet in front of the children and to play with herself and was told to keep showing them what she was doing until Violet told Kay to stop. Violet had Kay continue the performance until the other children looked away. What kind of instructor was this? This is literally Satan on earth. Violet told the kids if they told their parents that something dreadful would happen. At that time, Laura saw bruises and cuts on Kay's legs up to the knees. The witness had seen other cuts and bruises on Kay's head and body and had seen Violet tie bandages around Kay's head. Sometimes cuts on the girl's legs would be bleeding and blood would be dripping on the floor. To cover up black and blue mark on Kay's head and face, Violet put on cream cake makeup. The witness had also seen Mr. Verdugo spank Kay Francis with a strap. There were other pupils, such as Thelma Watts, who took lessons from Mr. Verdugo, saw Kay Francis in September 1950 with blackened eyes described as purplish, puffy and barely open. Violet's explanation was that the little girl believed she could heal herself and that was the reason she had done blacked her eyes, made her eyes in the conditions they were. One of Kay's fingers was bandaged and two or three other fingers were black and blue. Violet had stated that Kay had bumped her head against a wall and on the accordion in self-abuse and in respect to the finger, she had chewed on them. That's so stupid. I chew my fingernails. I don't chew through my fingers, do I? Now, waitresses at the Panama Cafe testified that Violet and Vertigo often brought Kay there and that the little girl was quiet and did not look happy. That bruises on face and legs were explained as having been self-inflicted. One waitress 
could not recall any occasion when a meal was ordered for Kay, although sometimes the child would get a cracker or a little soup from one of the others. And before I continue, there's someone missing in this story. Where is the mother? Remember, her mother dumped her off and cut her off. On one occasion, in answer to the waitress's inquiry as to the condition of Kay's eyes, Violet said she's not telling anything about what happened, she doesn't want to talk. Now the defence claimed during the latter part of the trial that Violet Burling was unwell. According to the defence's account, there are 47 separate references to her mental and physical condition, including many recesses granted for this reason, extending from a few minutes to five days. Now, I'm going to go through some of these extensions. It's tedious and it's repetitive, but bear with me. Listen to this. Now on March the 8th, the trial court excused the jury, having observed that Violet appeared ill with a severe tremor and she is sitting now at the council table with her head down and her eyes closed part of the time, which was a description of her condition. To the court's inquiry, she gave them no answer and it didn't show any alertness, nor was she in a position to defend herself. During these moments, Viola stated that she could carry on and did not wish to have a doctor called, but the court did not agree with her. So a recess was taken until the afternoon session and a physician was called. According to the doctor, Viola appeared listless and apathetic, although conscious. The patient complained of headaches, weakness and dizziness. It was the physician's opinion that her present condition was functional, but she was emotional and nervous and upset. She was capable of understanding a wire recording or understanding questions and answers. With an emotional disturbance such as she had some inattention to her surroundings was likely to happen. And as the trial went on, Violet stated that she might become dizzy. So the court went on to say, we can't tell when you are going to become dizzy or when you are in such a condition that you don't know what is going on. Will you try? If you feel something like that, let me know and the court can help you in such conditions so we can stop any proceedings until you are not dizzy and are fully conscious. To which she responded yes and she said sometimes the room keeps going round. So at this moment it seems to me with all the strain and all the pressure that she's experiencing, her brain is going cuckoo. As it continued on March 14th, Violet was unnerved and shaking and the judge stated if you feel faint or if you are not conscious of what is going on, please tell me or your counsel. However, as noted in her brief, the court did not indicate how Violet could inform the court of her state if she was unconscious. Later that same day, while on the witness stand, Violet asked for a recess and it was given. Again, on March the 15th, the court's attention was called to the fact that Violet appeared tired. Later that day, the court got no response to an inquiry as to Violet's condition. Finally, Violet admitted being upset, dizzy and not able to think clearly. Then, although the court stated she is ill and we will have to go over until tomorrow, nevertheless, the proceedings continued with stipulations and corrections of testimony in the daily record and the preliminary transcript. Certain testimony was stricken from the record and the jury admonished to disregard it. A recess was then taken. We move on to March the 20th. Viola answers to questions become inaudible and the condition of dizziness having returned, the trial was recessed until the next day. On March the 28th, during cross-examination, Viola said, the appearance of being very tired and of not being in a position to look after my interests, my eyes are closing. And the judge said, you are practically dropped over as though you were in a poor physical and mental state. However, Viola indicated that the trial should proceed. But the judge said, let's take a recess. And a few minutes later, Viola fainted. The following morning, Viola thought the trial might safely proceed. The court, however, observed that she has the appearance of being not clear in her mental behavior. She is just not alert and that there were other things that were written on the record that may have to be taken off. They believed she was not in a condition to go ahead that morning. They said that she seemed to lose partial consciousness. Now the jail physician, Dr. Crahan, reported that Violet was not physically or mentally ill but was suffering emotionally due to strain, that she was subject to fainting spells. 
Violet complained of feeling dizzy, but felt able to go ahead. The district attorney resumed cross-examination, whereupon she fainted and fell from the witness stand. Court was adjourned until the following Monday, at which time a woman deputy sheriff was requested to sit beside Violet. Later, a recess became necessary because of her faintness. So at this moment, for some reason, well, maybe because she was finally realizing I should not have treated the child this way, the Muppet, she just keeps fainting and fainting and fainting. And I don't think this is all fake because it's the trial. It's the judge telling her, whoa, 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 you don't look right. Calm, relax. Now on April the 3rd, although dizzy and woozy, Violet resumed the witness stand. But at 11 a.m., fainted again and she fell out of the witness box. Violet's condition appeared to be worsening rather than improving, causing the judge to say, I can't have the jury sitting here watching a defendant fall to the floor day after day in a fainting condition and in a condition that shows she gives every impression she is not able to look after her own interests. In the afternoon, Violet was still weak and dizzy and a recess taken until the next day. Violet then returned to the hospital section of the jail. On April 4th, Violet was somewhat dizzy but claimed she could go to the stand. The deputy sheriff reported that Violet's condition was very poor. It was worse than the day before. She seemed to be on the verge of losing consciousness. She was staggering. She kept pitching forward and then regained consciousness. And at that moment, counsel for both sides agreed that the trial could not go ahead and it was adjourned. On the adjourned date, cross-examination of Violet was resumed, but some of the questions had to be repeated three times. Violet again became weak and faint, whereupon court was recessed until the next day. I know, I know. I told you this would be a tedious exercise. Cross-examination was again resumed, although Violet was somewhat dizzy. In the middle of a statement by the district attorney, Violet started to faint and a recess was declared. The next day, Violet resumed the stand, but swayed back and forth, was having tremors, and finally started to faint, but said she wanted to keep going. The record discloses that similar episodes occurred on ensuing days, and on April 12th, Violet again fated. I feel like Bill Murray in Groundhog Day. Now, after a brief recess, the trial court stated, I have been informed by the deputy sheriff that the defendant did not lose consciousness during this last partial fainting and the loss of strength to go ahead, but that she was in a state of collapse. Notwithstanding that condition, Violet still expressed a desire to proceed and the re-examination continued. So you get the picture of all this tomfoolery, but thankfully that's now over and let's move on to specific aspects of the trial. Prosecutors did their best to make Violet out to be a witch woman, even introducing a photo of the teacher in a weird top knot and suggesting that it was indicative of more than just a bad hair day. They called on other pupils who took the stand to talk about the abuse. The other students said they had often seen Kay tied to a chair and in filing cabinets. Former pupils showed up and testified that the teacher had hurt them as well. Another nine-year-old told the court, Sometimes I think I'd like to see her die in the gas chamber. The week before Kay's death, Violet said the child had been sleepwalking, lapsing in and out of trances and talking about death. Violet said she called Erickson, the mother, that week to tell her that her daughter was out of control. Erickson offered a simple explanation. She said a family friend was performing black magic on Kay. Huh? It took the jury nine days of stormy deliberation to reach a verdict. Guilty. The judge sentenced her to life in prison. A year later, Violet's lawyers used a bizarre argument to win her a retrial. You know how she kept fainting? Well, often during the trial, they claimed she was mentally absent. In his decision, the judge wrote, the conviction cannot be approved because of the violation of the defendant's fundamental right to be present physically and mentally. Hold on a minute. She kept saying, no, 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 I'm okay. Let's go ahead. Huh? However, in May 1953, after a one-day retrial without a jury, the judge upheld her conviction and sent her ass back to prison. She tied her up, she put her on chairs, she put her in cabinets, strapped her to the floor, abused her. What was wrong with this sick woman? I think her and Mr. Verdugo, her boss, I think they had some kind of fantasy, role play, whatever fetish they had, right? 
I don't know what happened to Mr. Vertigo. If you could look it up, let me know. Either way, may this cow never be released. I was so sickened by what she did. I didn't even check if she was released. I didn't even check if she's alive. I don't know. Anyway, tell me what you think.